Praise the Lord. Welcome to Christ Fellowship Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bill's over preaching in Knightstown today, so we bless them, right? Why don't you stand with me and let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. We thank you that you're here in our midst, God, and that you're a big God that can handle everything that's in our lives, God. And we pray, Father, that today that you'll be glorified in this place, be glorified in our lives, Father. And we just want to give you praise, Father. We pray that you'll do things in this place that man can't do and change us to be what you want us to be, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just give him a clap offering of praise today. <coughs> Worthy, Jesus. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Jesus is running after you today, amen.
so good, isn't he? The Bible talks about a time when Israel just failed, man. They thought God wasn't on their side anymore. But then there came a time when they repented and they knew that they needed God. And God came through for them in a big way. Bible says that Samuel built an altar and he named it Ebenezer, which means stone of help, so that they would never forget that God is their help. Amen. Today we pray for Israel today that God would be their help. Amen. But I want to encourage you today that God is your help no matter where you're at, no matter what you need, that God is your help. Amen.
Hallelujah. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, God. There's none like you. Hallelujah. Can I have everybody stand with me today? And we're going to pray today. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're uh, the author and perfect of, or of our, perfecter of our faith, Lord God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our strength. You're our refuge and strength, Lord God. I thank you that you're here with us today. And so, Father, I just pray over every person in this room who has needs, Lord God. We come to you today. We came to your presence today. We came into your house today because we have needs, Father, and we know that you're the provider of our needs, Lord God. So right now, I pray that you'll touch our hearts. Right now, I pray for healing of our hearts and for healing of our minds and for healing in our bodies, Lord God. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that you'll unleash the Holy Spirit into our lives to flow, Lord God, and to strengthen us and to give us hope, Lord God, in a hopeless time that you are the God of hope. You're the blessed hope, Jesus. So right now, we thank you, Father, and we just open our hearts to you and receive from you. Now, Lord, I I ask everybody to just point your hands up here at this prayer box, all the prayer needs that people have placed in this box right here. We pray over every one of them, Lord God, that in Jesus' name, that you'll be the miracle worker, that you'll be what they need. We pray for families to be healed, Lord God. We pray for relationships to be healed. We pray uh, for hope and, and, and place of depression, Lord God. We pray, Father, for healings in people's bodies. We pray, Lord God, that you'll provide people's financial needs, Lord, all these needs in this box. We turn it over to you, Lord God, and thank you that you're a big God, that you're bigger than our issues in our lives, Father. So we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated. Can I have the ladies come up, please, though? We're going to take up this morning's tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you for being such a good father to us. We thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. And we pray, Father, right now in Jesus' name that you'll receive our tithes and offerings as we give to you from our heart. Use it mightily for your kingdom right here in Rushville and all around the world in Jesus' name. Amen. And how's everybody doing today? You good? I don't get a chance to do this very often, but who has a testimony of praise that you want to give God praise today? Rhonda? God is great and greatly to be praised. I just give him glory for saving my life, saving my family. Um, I was laying in the bed the other day, and I wasn't even praying. I was just, uh, I, I was so overwhelmed just by life in general. And he started showing me times that I've known for a fact that he has saved this natural life. Um, He showed me a couple um, times like that I got to see that it could only be him. And like one time, like when my kids were little, um, I was driving the car and I went over um, some railroad tracks that was raised up quite a bit and it had knocked my tailpipe loose and I had just left John's job site. So I backed up and when I turn around to go back to the job site to let him know what happened, the te- the tailpipe had flipped up and went through the gas tank. And it was throwing sparks everywhere before I even got back to the job site. And John's like, you guys could have died. And I just praise God because only he could have protected us from that. And then, like, um, back about five, six years ago, um, we had a lot of rain. And the basement where we live used to flood and it was i had to go down there to plug in the um sub pump and the water was all the way up my thighs and i didn't even think about shutting the power off to the hot water heater 
And I didn't even feel so much as a tingle as I walked through that water. And John got home, and I told him how deep the water was down there. He said, did you shut the power off to the hot water heater? I said, no, I didn't even think about it. All I thought about was getting that water out of the basement. And I praise God because he didn't just save my soul. He has saved my natural body so that I could be here to spread his word, to let everybody know how good he is. And he just wants us to serve him. He just wants us to let other people know so that he can save them. He don't desire for nobody to end up in hell, but it's up to us to love him enough, to come to him, to give him all the praise and the glory, to live for him, to raise our families for him. I just give him all the praise and glory. Amen. He's good, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> hey, can you hit the fans, please? Who else has a testimony of praise today? Man, God's moving in our lives. You got one? Yeah. Um, I've had a, I'd say Jason and I have been carrying a burden for a while and in prayer. And just yesterday, God showed me some very, very specific prayers, very specific. Someone who's not even following Jesus spoke words that confirm that God is doing what I've asked him to do. <laughs> Amen. And he had no idea, or that person had no idea. Right. Anybody else have a testimony of praise today? Yeah, Kim Brianna. Um. Most of you probably do not know. Um, I've been attending physical therapy, and for those of you have, that have known me and whatnot, have seen me, I have to walk with this lovely cane right now because I'm, I'm off balance, and um, I've lost some muscle tone and some strength and stuff, and so it's fibromyalgia, and so... Um, I'm doing physical therapy, and um, when I first started phys physical therapy about a month ago, they, I was just so, so weak, and they told me, we're not sure how long it's going to take to build your strength back up, so to speak, and so I instantly just began to just pray, um, because I know that God is a bigger than anything that we go through. And I just went to physical therapy on Friday. Um, I walked 25 minutes wow. on a treadmill. She said, she said, you're, you're looking good. Can I touch your strength? And I thought to myself, I've only been doing this for about a month now, so, and, but the whole time I'm in there and I'm watching my feet and I'm thinking to myself and I'm trying not to laugh because I have the skinniest leg and if anybody knows my mother and paid attention, my mom had the skinniest bird legs that she ever did see. And so, I'm, so she said, you can play around with that and I thought, it's an anti-gravity thing. So when you get into this thing, they collaborate your weight and whatnot. And I was just telling her, like, I, every time I get in it, I feel like it's going to shoot me up to the moon. <laughs> and while well, she went to collaborate, and this thing just, like, literally, would, I felt like it was going to shoot me to the moon. But anyway, she said, I'm going to test your strength. And... So she tested my strength and whatnot. They do these little things and whatnot. And she said, Kimberly, I just have to tell you, I don't know what's going on here. She said, but your strength, you've got a lot of your strength back. And you are you're doing amazing in your therapy. And But I want you to keep coming because I want you to get stronger. So, I mean, it, it, it's not man. I'm here to tell you it's not man. Um, yeah. There's so many people in this world that think that, you know, it's the doctors, it's physical therapy, um, it's the people working with you and whatnot. But I'm here 
as a testimony to tell you that it's God, it's God. If we would just open up our hearts and our minds to him and let him pour out what he intends to do. And I have been telling, I've been in this season and whatnot, and I've been telling everybody that sometimes we just have to wait. Sometimes we snap our fingers and say, God, I want it now. Sometimes we have to wait. And if we will go to that secret place and talk with God, I'm telling you, um, it's amazing. So um, I just thank God for all of his blessings, and I'll shut up now. Hey, stay here for a second, okay? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm reminded of the time when Jesus went to heal a blind man, and he said, can you see? And he said, I see men as trees walking, and, and Jesus didn't give up until that guy was completely healed, right? And so let's, why don't you stretch your hands toward Kim Brianna. Father, we thank you. We praise you for this good praise report of how the, the amazing, miraculous work that you're doing in her life, and we see that you're doing things that man can't do, Father. So we pray in Jesus' name that you'll complete this healing in her in the name of Jesus. Jesus, by your stripes she was healed. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Complete this work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Anybody else before we move on? God's good, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. All right. Karen? I, I can't. I've just got to do this uh, to show God's sense of humor. Oldest son is, has neuro, is uh, neurologically uh, affected, and uh, he was in an accident recently. And um, his car was totaled. He was not hurt at all. Um, he walks uh, with two canes, and, and, and he's shaken up and, and, and all that. But to make a long story short, we all started looking for used cars. And he, says, he called me one day, and he says, Mom, I just want my old car back, but that's not possible. I want one just like it. And uh, his wife, was uh, a couple days later, was walking down the road around, around their um, town, and there was a used car lot, and there was a car exactly like theirs sitting there. It was the same color, the same brand, that it was a Buick. Uh, and um, so she ran home and told him, and they, they uh, got some transportation, went to look at it. It was exactly the same, inside and out, only it was nicer inside because they're not the neatest people. It was the nicest, it's the nicest car. And, and, and to this sense of humor, the only thing wrong with it the glove compartment had a little bit of a, a, of a, it was a little bit crooked, just exactly like their old car was. <laughs> exactly, you know? And of course, we were praying hard since he yes. said he wanted the same car. We were praying hard for him to find one at least close to it. It was exactly like it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, I want to tell you something. This is, why, this is why I like testimony time, because listen to me, okay? This is something that we as a church were praying for. You know, we've got our prayer time and everything and pray over the needs in this box. If you have a prayer need, you can get one of these cards and put it in here. We have a prayer team that prays over it all week. And so that was something that our church was praying for. And look at how God answered our prayers, amen? God's so good. Yeah, Sue. It's good to see you guys, by the way. Well, as you all know, um, I went through a really trying couple of years. And um, I'm not here to talk about uh, healing in your body, but a healing in your heart. And I just want to thank everybody for their prayers and their support. But I just want everybody to know that God can restore the joy and the happiness and the love into your heart. And he gives us a heart big enough to love more than one person. And I love Tim. He's helped me get through a very difficult time. And so I just praise God for him. And I praise God for this church and all the support that I've had during this time. And we love you guys. Love you guys. It's so good to see you. Amen. All right. Yeah, Mom. See, this is good. I don't have a praise report. But I just wanted to point something out. Um, what we've heard today, how God works, we have seen him work in protection, healing, provision, and restoration. 
So whatever your need is, he supplies it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great observation. It's all the things that we pray for, amen, and when we're seeing it happen, amen. God's so good. I've got a couple of announcements for you real quick. Uh, this week, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. is Bible study here at the church. Who remembers what we talked about this past Wednesday? You guys remember. What is it? Good job. We talked about the parable of the wheat and tares, and so this week, the Lord's laid on my heart, and rather than going on to the next parable that we were going to go to, uh, we're going to continue that a little bit, when what we're going to talk about this week is tares versus chaff. So keep that in your mind, because it's going to be pretty interesting, okay? Tares versus chaff. So if you want to be ready for this, and I'll post it on Facebook, but if you want to be ready, read Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. It's going to be an interesting discussion, all right? Now, next announcement, youth group for, for kids between the age of 6th grade and 12th grade. Youth group is next Sunday, and uh, we're going to be good next week, right? Praise the Lord. We're believing that we're going to be good next week, and we're going to have youth group next week, and it's going to be good for these kids. It's from 5 to 6 p.m. That's all the announcements I have. Does anybody have anything you want to talk about? Uh, the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are on their way. Still no delivery date, but hopefully we'll have them next Sunday. Um, so Operation Christmas Child, we take these boxes that are about the size of a shoe box. If you've recently bought shoes, you can use that as your shoe box. Um, but you just pack it full of little goodies for kids that are anywhere in the whole world. Um, toys, clothes, whatever will fit in that little, ba little box. And then write a little letter to the kid. Um, so that there's some connection that there's actually a person on the other end of it who packed it for them. Um, but we will be collecting those through the next month. I think it's uh, the week of November 17th, something like that is nas National Collection Week. So we will collect through that time. And uh, we're going to get, when we get the boxes, we're going to have a table in the back with those boxes on it. And, uh, and you guys, when you fill, as you fill them, you can put your boxes on the table in the back. And, uh, and so just to let you know what's happening, we have 50 boxes on order. That's what we've been trying to fill the past couple of years. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have 50 boxes back there. We're going to pay the shipping for those 50 boxes. If you choose to go above and beyond, which is a blessing, right, then we'll ask you to pay the shipping on those extra boxes. But we'll have 50, and that should be a good number for us, really, I think. Yeah, you got an announcement? Well, there's a list. So it'll be on the video for people. There's a list of things that you can and cannot send. They don't want you to send candy and lotions and things like that. Do you want me to print that list and so we can put it on the table or something? I mean, I can print it. I can make several copies, and we can do that. That way, at least people know not to, you know, you can't send a lot of different things. And then you have the option. Of, they want you to send books, but the issue is we don't know where our box is going or what language it's going to. So, you know, that's just something to think about. Yep. Yeah, thank you for reminding me because I was actually about to bring that up, but it was slipping my mind, so thank you. Yeah, there are some things that you can't put in there that they uh, – one, one year we had somebody put a razor, like one of those carpet utility knives, and the, you can't do stuff like that, okay? Anyway, so do you want to print those for next week then? There will be a list on the table out front that sh tells you what you can and can't bring. There are also, uh, I think, three different age groups and four boys and girls. So we're going to have all that ready for you. You can choose the th one of the three age groups for your box, and whether it's a boy or a girl, and there's going to be like a sticker or something that you can fill out to, so that we'll know uh, what's in your box, okay? Good stuff. All right, well, the kids can be dismissed for Sunday school. Let's pray for them as they go down. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these children. God, bless them. Father, do a big work in their lives. Bless the teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys ready for the word today? Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. We'll get there in just a little bit. 
So today we're continuing our series called the Mountain Series. How many of you guys have been enjoying the Mountain Series? I love it. I love these stories of mountaintop experiences in the Bible. And so what we're after, what we're seeking is as we encounter these mountaintop experience stories in the Bible, we're seeking for ourselves to have mountaintop experiences as well. Amen. Why? Because God has called this church to climb to new heights and, and we're running after what God says. So as we go through this, these stories in the Bible, we need to remember that they're not just stories in the Bible, that they're for us, amen? And so as we read these stories, we're seeking our own mountaintop experiences right now. How many of you believe God can do that in your life? Amen. How many of you know that, uh, that it's human nature to not like change, right? Am I right? It's human nature. I was counting this morning. I was sitting there uh, counting this morning, and I'm 51 years old. And over the course of my entire life, from the time I was born until now, I've lived in exactly 20 houses, 20 houses my whole life. That's crazy, guys. You know what that is? That's a lot of change right there. How many of you know it's human nature to not like change, but I've been through a lot of change in my life, right? And so here's the deal. Uh, my wife and I, we, we chose to finally settle down in Rushville, and, and so we've been in our current house for, for almost, what, 18 years, almost 18 years. Next spring will be 18 years that we've been in that house, and I'm telling you, from the time I was born until now, we, we've lived in that house for far, far longer than I've lived in any other house in my life, right? But that's how it works, guys, and I'm at the point now where you've, uh, we, we've been married for, what, almost 23 years, and so I'm at the point right now where over 23 years, you amass a lot of stuff. How many of you can testify to that? You amass a lot of stuff, and after living in that house for 18 years, I don't ever want to move again, guys. I'll tell you this, I'm not moving again unless I can afford to hire somebody else to move me. Amen. I don't know if I can do that or not. But here's the deal, guys. How many of you know that, the, 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 that we often experience changes in our lives, and sometimes we, we can control it, and other times we can't control it, but we, whether we like it or not, we go through times where we experience change in our lives. And I'm here to encourage you today that if the change that you're experiencing is part of God's plan for you, then no matter how hard it is to go through that change, God's plan is that you will have a glorious result in the end. Amen. You can count on that. You can have faith in that, that if you're going through a change, even if it's hard, that the end result is going to be glorious if God has a hand in it. Amen. Sometimes we make dumb decisions, and it's not God's choice that we're going through change, and he's not guaranteeing that it's going to have a glorious result. He's a merciful God. He even says that God works all things for good for those who are called and, and who love God and who are called according to his purposes. So he is merciful, but I want you to know that if his hand is in it, that you're guaranteed that the end result is going to be glorious. Now, are you with me in Matthew 17, 1? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go to another mountaintop experience today. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Everybody say he was transfigured. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, get up, do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the son of man has risen from the dead. I want to point something out here in this story. 
Jesus could have got on top of that mountain. He could have had this experience on top of the mountain. He could have had this discussion with Moses and Elijah on top of the mountain all by himself. He could have done that all by himself. But he chose to take his three closest disciples. He chose to take Peter, James, and John with him. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just experience this all by himself? I believe that he wanted them to be eyewitnesses of an amazing event that was on top of that mountain. You know, out of all the mountaintop experiences that we're talking about in the Bible, this is one of the craziest. This is one of the most insane mountaintop experiences, but it's one of the most awesome mountaintop experiences. And I believe that there are three reasons that Jesus brought them along instead of going by himself. And the first reason that Jesus brought him along is because he was revealing his glory. Everybody say revealing his glory. My dad used to have a Superman t-shirt. Do you remember that? (laughs) Who has that now? One of the grandkids got it, I think. Probably Caleb, probably was. He had this Superman t-shirt. It was a blue t-shirt with the Superman symbol right there. It was probably the old style, not the new style, right? The old style. Uh, You guys remember Christopher Reeves? Christopher Reeve and George Reeves even before him. You remember that guy? George Reeve was Superman. Okay, so he had this Superman t-shirt that he liked to wear all the time, and he'd wear like a a button-up flannel shirt over that t-shirt, and any time one of the grandkids would come by, he he would grab his button-up shirt, and he'd go like this and go, oh, you weren't meant to see that. You weren't supposed to see that. (laughs) It was a big reveal. It was like a big reveal that their papa was actually Superman, right? It only works till a certain age, and then they start wising up to it, right? Oh, you weren't supposed to see that. It was a reveal that their papa was Superman, right? I believe that this mountaintop experience right here that we're reading in the scriptures was a time when Jesus wanted to reveal his true nature and his glory to his closest disciples right there. You see, all along they'd seen this miracle-working son of man. He was the son of man, right? They saw the miracles that he worked, but he looked just like they did, and he ate supper with them just like they did, and and he looked like he was just a man. Even though he performed these miracles that were coming from somewhere, he looked just like they did, the Son of Man. But Jesus wanted to take this chance right here, this opportunity right here in this precious moment that Jesus revealed himself to them, not just as a normal man like they are, but as the almighty son of God, the true nature and glory that was beneath this layer of flesh right here found its way outward. Are you paying attention today? The glory that was within him on top of that mountaintop that found its way from the inside to the outside so that just for a moment that they could get a glimpse with their own eyes the true nature of who Jesus is, the true glory of who Jesus is. You see, Jesus wanted to remind his disciples that he wasn't just one of their good buddies. He wasn't just a father who wants to take them fishing and and spoil them with good gifts all the time. That's not who he is. That's not all of who he is. (coughs) But he wanted to remind his three closest disciples that not only is he their good buddy, but he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. How many of you are grateful that Jesus is in control and that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Amen. There were two times in the Bible, if you read through the Gospels, there were two times in the Bible where the Father spoke out of the heavens over his Son. Two times. Can you remember what those two times were? The baptism and the transfiguration. See, when Jesus was baptized, it was the beginning of his ministry on the earth. He was 30 years old, but that was when his ministry began after he was baptized in the Jordan River. And as he came up from the water, it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And the Father spoke out of the heavens and said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Does that sound familiar to you right now? 
He said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The father spoke out of the heavens right there at the beginning of his ministry. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And then many, a long time later, you see this happened toward the end of his ministry. The transfiguration happened toward the end of his ministry where the father spoke out of the heavens and he said this. He said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. But he added this this time. He said, listen to him. What's the difference? You know, the amazing thing is that the father was ordaining him at the beginning of his ministry, but then toward the end of his ministry on top of that mountain when he was transfigured between, before Peter, James, and John's eyes, the father spoke forth again, and they were terrified. They were on their faces, right? And the father said, this is my beloved son. You know what this represents? This represents the beginning of, of Jesus' purpose becoming fulfilled on this earth. You see, because from that point, all of a sudden, now his ministry changes to where now his ministry is heading toward the cross, heading toward resurrection, where his purpose was about to be fulfilled. You see, in this mountain of transfiguration, there were still a few more chapters left of Matthew, but this is the beginning point of the end of his ministry, where his ministry is beginning to wind down to his purpose. And if you look at this, when Jesus was revealed in his glory, that was the beginning point of the kingdom of God coming into this earth. It's crazy, isn't it? It's just an amazing experience. It's something that seems so bizarre as we read it in the Bible. But if you turn back, and you don't have to turn there, you can look later. But in chapter 16, right before this happens, in in chapter 17, it's when Jesus reveals to his disciples that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. And then right after he reveals that, at the end of chapter 16, Jesus begins to foretell that he's about to die on the cross and he's about to be raised from the dead. He begins to foretell that right from that point on. And things are starting to change, and then they go on top of the mountain. Somebody tell me who were the three disciples that were with him. Peter, James, and John, right? In fact, many, many years later, Peter, who was on top of that mountain, begins to think back to this time, this experience. He begins to think back to the transfiguration. And this is what he says up here on the screen in 2 Peter 1, verse 16. He says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It's obvious right here that he's talking about the transfiguration experience that he witnessed with his own eyes. And verse 18, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. But look what it says here. Peter was an eyewitness to the power of and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the transfiguration. Now, I'm not telling you today that Jesus isn't coming back because he's coming back, and it could be sooner than you think, guys. Jesus promised that he's coming back again, and that's not what this means. It's not saying that he's not coming back, but what it's saying is that when he was on that mountain of transfiguration with his own eyes, he witnessed, he saw that tra- that transfiguration where Jesus showed his glory and showed the coming The coming of the great King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's the beginning right there. It's the beginning point of the kingdom of God coming into the earth. But I don't believe he he showed his glory to the disciples on that mountain. But I don't believe that's the only reason that Jesus brought Peter, James, and John upon that mountain that day. Because everything Jesus did when he was on this earth was an example for us. Amen. Amen. An example for us. And I believe that Jesus also wanted to give them a taste of the change that's within us. Everybody say the change within us. When Nikki and I were first dating, I took her on a great date to the zoo, Indianapolis Zoo. Uh, Such a good date, right? And I took her into the beautiful atrium there. Uh, It's an indoor, like 5,000 square feet 
indoor garden and a glass atrium where it's just so beautiful and you, you can see hundreds and hundreds of beautiful butterflies flying all around you. You're right in the middle of hundreds and hundreds of beautiful butterflies. And that was the moment when I learned a very important detail about my wife, that this woman who was going to become my wife someday is absolutely terrified of butterflies. <laughs> and I had her trapped right in the middle of hundreds of them, thousands of them, right all around her, right? What a great date that was. <laughs> in fact, yesterday we went to Brown County and was able to meet my, big, my older son, Shepard, there and hang out and spend the day with him. And we were walking around Nashville. And uh, anybody know where the library is in Nashville? It's a good place to park, right, if, everybody, if everywhere else is filled up, which it was yesterday. And so we, we've never been there before, and so we ended up seeing a part of town that we've never seen before, and it's crazy because this part of town, what we saw has been there since 1974, two years after I was born. It's been there forever, right? And so uh, <clears throat> we saw this one place that was the historical area of the town, and it was several uh, re rebuilt Pioneer cabins. Has anybody ever seen those there in Nashville, Indiana? You've seen them? Uh, several rebuilt. We've never seen them, and it was so cool, man. It's like, how have we missed this all these years, right? And so we were uh, in one of the, and we went through all these cabins and everything, and one of them was an old pioneer doctor's office, right? And we were standing there, and I was minding my own business looking in one room. Nikki was in the other room. She looked at me, and did, she said, did you see what's on the wall over there? what and I'm looking around there is a great big stuffed hawk on the ceiling is that what you're talking about no did you see what's on the wall over there there's a shadow box full of moths that were pinned in there right she's just freaking out <laughs> why am I bringing this up when I was a kid I used to have my own record player man and we had Mickey Mouse disco record to play on there and uh, Macho Duck. You remember that song? Macho, Macho Duck. <laughs> but we also had this other record called, uh, uh, it, it was called Bullfrogs and Butterflies. And it was a Christian kids song record. And it was called Bullfrogs and Butterflies. And, and so the title song goes like this, Bullfrogs and Butterflies, they both been born again. Okay. And so this song talks all about, it's a great song. You guys need to listen to it. Bullfrogs and butterflies, they've both been born again. It talks about a bullfrog, how it started off as a tadpole swimming in the water. You take that tadpole out of the water and it's going to die, right? It starts off like that, but eventually it, 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 it changes. It transforms over time into a bullfrog who can then come up on land and survive, right? And then it talks about butterflies who start off as a caterpillar. It asks the old caterpillar until the moment when they enter into that cocoon and they're transformed into a beautiful butterfly when they bust their way out of that cocoon, right? It's called, what's it called? It's called metamorphosis. Everybody say metamorphosis. You ever heard of that word before in seventh grade science class? Metamorphosis. They're changed into a completely different and new creature. They're not the same as what they used to be. They're changed into a completely different and new creature. And it reminds me of how Jesus told Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus came to him in the dark of the night, and he said, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be, what, born again. Bullfrogs and butterflies have both been born again, right? You must be born again. What, do you want me to enter into my mom's womb again? It just sounds nuts, doesn't it? Not to us, because we've heard it a thousand times. He says, no, you dummy. Read it. It's in there. It's in the Jason Cup translation of the Bible. <laughs> no, you dummy, that's not what I'm talking about. You must be born of water and of the spirit. You must be naturally born into this world and also spiritually born into the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5 teaches us that, that uh, 
that if you're in Christ, that, that you're a completely new creature. You've, you've become a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. The old things are gone. The new things have come. And so I want you to understand today that we, just like bullfrogs and butterflies, we have a change that's happening within us. There's a metamorphosis that's happening within us. When we come to Christ, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, and all of a sudden now there's a change that's beginning in our hearts, a transformative thing that's happening. From that point on, we're transforming, and we're being changed inside, guys. Look at this up on the screen. Uh, Actually, before we get to that, I want you to look back at Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. It says this, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Everybody say, he was transfigured. Now, we know that the New Testament was originally written in Greek, right? And this word, this this Greek word that we translate transfigured right there, guess what that word is? It's metamorpho-o. Have you ever, does that sound familiar to you guys? There was a metamorphosis that took place on the top of that mountain. He was transfigured. There was a metamorphosis that took place. And when we come to Christ and when we invite him into our hearts, we're born again as a new creature. The metamorphosis begins to happen within us. Look up here on the screen at 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says this, but we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord. Everybody say transformed. Transformed. Now look up here at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Everybody say transformed. Guess what Greek word that is? Transformed. It's metamorpho, the same word that we translate transfigured. He says this, we're being transfigured into the same image that Jesus was on top of that mountain, the same thing that the disciples saw on top of that mountain. Within us, we're being transfigured in the same way. It's like we're looking in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. Romans 12, 2 says that we're, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed, be transfigured by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. You see, God is leading us inside through this metamorphosis that's happening in our lives so that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can come into the will of God so that we can experience his glory from glory to glory to glory to glory. We're being transformed. We're being transfigured within ourselves. Amen. There's a work of God that's going on within you where you're being glorified within yourself. You're being changed inside, amen. Smith Wigglesworth once said, I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. But I believe there's one more reason that Jesus brought Peter, James, and John uh, on top of the mountain with him. He didn't just show his glory to them, right? He didn't just show the glory that's within to them. He brought the glory from inside to the outside for them to see. He was showing the disciples that there's going to come a day someday when they will be like him. Everybody say, we will be like him. Wow, guys. Somebody remind me who were the three disciples on the mountain. Peter, James, and John. John was on top of that mountain, and he saw the glory of God with his own eyes. He heard the voice of the Father with his own eyes. And I believe in 1 John, when he wrote these words, I believe in 1 John. I don't have a slide for this one, but I believe in 1 John. He might have been thinking back to that event when he said this. He said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared yet as what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. I'm telling you guys, there's going to come a time when we're changed to be like him. 
There's going to come a time when that transformative and glorious metamorphosis that's been happening on the inside of you will begin to break its way out from, this, from, from being just on the inside. It'll break its way through that fleshly veil that you have, and you'll be glorified to become just like he is. Now, I'm not saying today that we're going to be Jesus. I'm not saying that we are ever going to be God, but what I'm saying is there's coming a time when Jesus comes back that we're going to be glorified, and we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That metamorphosis that's within you is about to work its way out through that flesh veil. Imagine that with me, guys. In our physical bodies, we're going to be glorified the same way. There's one thing in this story that we haven't looked at yet, and that was Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah came, and they appeared to talk with Jesus. What in the world did they talk about? I have no idea. I'd love to know, wouldn't you? But why was it Moses and Elijah? Now, for one thing, Moses was the great deliverer of God's people who brought them out of Egypt and led them to the promised land. He's the one who gave them the law. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. He's the representative of Old Testament prophets. He's actually mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. But I believe there's something else to it that's so special for this particular event that Peter, James, and John were able to see this. And this is what it is. I want you to listen to me, okay? There was a time when Moses died. Did you know that? Because of his disobedience, God wouldn't allow him to enter into the promised land. And there was a time when Moses died. He was dead. They had his bones, guys. But Elijah never died, did he? Elijah never died. You see, he served the Lord and got to the point to where the Lord took him up in chariots of fire, and he just was translated back into the presence of the Lord without ever experiencing death. I want you to see something. Moses died, and in his glorified body, as he meets with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, he represents all the believers who will enter into God's kingdom through death. I don't know if it'll happen to me that way or or not, or if Jesus will come back first. But all those believers who die, Moses represents all those people, whereas Elijah represents all the believers who will experience this glorification and this transformation through the rapture when Jesus comes back someday. You have both events represented right there on top of the mountain of transfiguration. And look up here on the screen at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. It just lays it out right there. It says this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. All that is represented. 1 Thessalonians 4 is represented right there on the top of the mountain of transfiguration. You didn't know there's so much there in that story, did you? 1 Corinthians 15 takes it a step further and says, when that day comes, we're going to be changed. And verses 51 and 52 say this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. It's talking about dying there. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Everybody say, I'm going to be changed. What a glorious day that will be when the glory within us is displayed outside of us. What a glorious day that will be when all of our weaknesses and frailties of our flesh get ripped asunder and the Superman t-shirt underneath is unveiled and revealed to the world. No more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, no more suffering. What a glorious day that will be. Just give him a clap offering of praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that day's getting closer and closer. Just look around you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus took his closest three disciples on top of the mountain of transfiguration so that they could experience the glory with him. 
But you know what? This event has been written in the annals of biblical history in the Bibles and the books that are right before your eyes right now because he wants us to experience his glory too. Can I have the team come up, please? I want to tell you guys something. I want to ask you that question one more time. Are you ready? Because today could be your day if you're not ready. Today could be your day. Why put it off? Why put it off until it's too late? I don't want to risk that right now. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to pray. I'm going to release you. But if you need Jesus, if you need today to be your day when you come to Jesus, I want you to come up to me afterwards, and I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to be right up here to pray with you. Amen. Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for showing us your glory. I thank you that you want us to experience it ourselves. Thank you, God, for all the work that you're doing in our lives. And I pray for each one of us, God, that you'll show us who you are and show us who we are. Lord, we want to change to be like you. We want to change to be what you've called us to be. So I speak that over each one of us. Lord, help us to open our hearts, those of us who don't know you yet, those of us who have not accepted you as our Lord and Savior. I pray that you'll convict our hearts and draw us to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we give you the glory today. Now lift your hands as I pronounce the blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Now let's sing this song to the Lord right now. this week.